Terry, and thanks everyone for joining me this morning. Um, the uh, BAS 3 uh, Student Self-Report College Edition is our topic of the day. And um, the BAS 3 um, College Edition uh, has always been part of, um, of the BASC system, uh, but because of its age range of 18 through 25, has been um, a little less well known than some of the other measures. So um, Pearson decided to create this uh, webinar uh, to give individuals uh, a better introduction to the instrument. So I hope you find it useful. First, please note on this um, uh, initial page, uh, my conflict of interest. And as a result of that, you will see a number of citations of research in this particular presentation uh, where um, I am not involved in the research effort. So hopefully that will mitigate to some extent um, uh, any bias that I might introduce. So please pay special attention to some of the individual research cited on the pages that follow. Um, I'll begin by um, observing that uh, I've been waiting for some time for um, the assessment of uh, college students uh, in the social emotional realm to become routine again. It was routine uh, when I entered college um, uh, back in 1970. Uh, I recall uh, clearly as a freshman in a uh, private liberal arts college in the Midwest, we were all required to take the MMPI on the first day of classes. Uh, I remember how odd some of the items were and how uh, long it took all of us to complete the MMPI. Um, but evidently, um, back at, in that particular time, as some of you may have had the same experience, the MMPI was being used as uh, a method for identifying social emotional risk or mental health uh, risk uh, among college students. I received a call from my um, from the counseling center at the college asking me to come in and speak with the counselor uh, to discuss my MMPI results. I, I also remember clearly uh, that the counselor, uh, the college counselor telling me uh, that I had a little tendency toward worry and that I should uh, monitor that and uh, get back in touch with her if it caused me any problems um, and during my course of study at the college. Today we're essentially talking about the same thing. Uh, the college form is designed for just that purpose. It's only about half the length of the MMPI. Um, the items are uh, not as odd or peculiar or um, with the exception, of course, of some of the validity scale items. Um, but the purpose is the same, and that is to identify college uh, students with uh, social emotional needs. Now, the, the term SRP college is used purposely because that is the norming sample, as we'll talk about um, in the upcoming slides. It was normed exclusively on individuals enrolled in post-secondary education opportunities. Most of these individuals in the norming sample were in four-year colleges and universities. However, a significant number were in community colleges. And some of the students in the norming sample for ages 18 to 25 were individuals enrolled in a variety of trade schools or um, other even one-year academic programs. And some of the individuals in the norming example were um, uh, individuals who were taking post-secondary courses but not intending to receive a college degree. So what was the reason for this? Well, uh, we thought that uh, post-secondary education, because it was increasing in frequency and popularity, um, produced a need for uh, better social-emotional assessment tools. Um, secondly, however, with the practical consideration, it's difficult to find a fairly representative sample for norming purposes outside of individuals who were enrolled in post-secondary educational institutions. It's just much more difficult 
to find a community-based sample that was not enrolled. So, um, so the college form really is designed for use by mental health practitioners, uh, college counselors, uh, college counseling services personnel, um, university uh, mental health services personnel, and even private practitioners who might be uh, working with individuals between 18 and 25 uh, years of age. So uh, let's proceed to the next slide. And so uh, essentially what we're talking about doing here, if we use this such as um, the MMPI was used for myself back in the 1970s, is we're talking about screening and surveillance. And uh, by screening, uh, I mean we're trying to identify college age students or students between the ages of 18 and 25 who might have some risk for mental health disorders, such as I displayed when I took the MMPI. Um, so um, from a prevention standpoint, we hope to find individuals with subclinical symptoms of depression, anxiety, inattention, hyperactivity, low self-esteem, could be a variety of problems that might produce risk for poor mental health or academic uh, outcomes, um, or uh, identification of individuals who have not been identified previously as having a mental health disorder. And so in clinical settings, you might use the SRP College Edition to um, uh, as part of a comprehensive um, assessment uh, to identify um, a particular disorder. And thirdly, with regard to surveillance, uh, what this allows administrators to do in post-secondary institutions is essentially uh, monitor the mental health status and the risk status of the entire population. And this is being done in um, some universities in Korea uh, by my colleague um, Christine Ahn and um, Chad um, Abesutami. Um, and uh, you'll see some of the citations for their research here. As some of you may know, um, suicide uh, in the population at large, particularly in the adolescent and young adult population, it's an international epidemic. Um, and so in a country like Korea, where, uh, like the US, there's a significant um, suicide rate um, among uh, youth and um, college age individuals, uh, this notion of surveying entire populations allows one to assess the efficacy of college counseling services for reducing risk, prevent, preventing um, suicidal actions. So for this reason, I'm referring you to a book that focuses on prevention, early identification, surveillance, and mental health diagnosis, uh, written by uh, Megan Stifler and, and Bridget Dever. And uh, I give you the link here for the e-copy of the book. Next slide, please. And as is always the case, uh, single informants may introduce, um, uh, may not provide actually enough information uh, to engage in a comprehensive assessment. So I wanted to uh, make uh, the listeners aware today that whether it's um, a three-year-old or a 25-year-old, uh, it's always wise to introduce some qualitative assessment into the assessment process. And, and this is why we created the structured developmental history for the original BASC and now for the BASC 3 in both digital and uh, pencil paper formats. So for those of you who are BASC 3 users, you're probably familiar with the structured developmental history, so I will not spend much time on it except to say that this qualitative information um, brings um, uh, brings information that we need that gives us a good check on the quantitative information that we will bring, uh, that we will obtain from the SRP College Edition. So for example, the SRP College Edition 
cannot assess age of onset. And uh, the only way to get at age of onset or rapidity of onset um, is, um, is through qualitative assessment of um, the display of symptoms over time. And that has to be done by question and answer. Structured developmental history, in this case, can be taken um, from the student uh, uh, themselves or it could um, actually be taken from uh, a parent or potentially a long-term partner in this case. So, um, so this is just a reminder that the SRP college, uh, college edition will give us good quantitative results with known reliability, known validity evidence. Um, but no matter how good the reliability and the validity, uh, qualitative, background information, good history will be necessary for checking the quantitative data, clarifying the quantitative data, identifying uh, false negatives and false positives uh, based on the quantitative data we get from um, the self-report. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the SRP uh, clinical and adaptive scales. And I, I want you to, um, participants to be aware that there's quite a bit of continuity in the SRP across age level from eight through uh, the college edition at age 25. Um, and at the same time, we do introduce some new scales, eliminate some old scales to make sure, uh, or some scales used at, pre at previous levels to make sure um, that each version is well suited, uh, particularly the content uh, and the constructs are well suited to the individual age groups of concern. So attitude towards school and teachers, for example, those um, scales and the item content for them is just not well suited uh, to individuals in uh, post-secondary educational institutions. Um, similarly, school maladjustment is um, a proxy for those two measures, but the item content is more appropriate for ages 18 to 25. Another thing that you'll notice uh, as you look at the validity data, uh, as I speak about that, is that there's quite a bit of continuity in terms of factor structure. And there are some independent studies of factor structure to show that the same factors emerge um, at, from ages 8 through 25 for the self-reported personality. It's really important. The reason why it's important is because when I Googled yesterday, I found 666 studies uh, using the search term BASC, um, but very few, relatively few of those studies are on the SRP College Edition. In addition, uh, um, there were many studies on the SRP adolescent form for ages 12 through 21. So this continuity is important because it suggests that a lot of the research done on the adolescent scale, which is primarily conducted on individuals 12 through 18 years of, old, of age, um, might apply to the SRP college edition as well. So if you decide to pick up the SRP College Edition, um, it, it would be worth some your time to look at the research on the Adolescent Edition. I will do that for you today. Um, I'll give you a sampling of that research so you can think about interpretation of the College Edition based upon the validity data that's available for that form, but also on individuals from 12 to 17 years of age, 12 to 18 years of age. So uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So this is the norming sample as I described to you uh, previously, uh, 300 students, 18 through 25. Um, and so uh, table 8.7 refers to the uh, BASC 3 manual. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, my apologies to those of you who are listening. 
Um, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end, so uh, Sherry at Pearson is moving the slides for me, so I regret that delay. So I'm going to cover the, the basic psychometric properties, um, sampling and reliability uh, very quickly, but also with some independent citations. I'm going to spend much more time on the validity evidence the basic psychometric properties, norming and reliability, are quite good. Um, it's, it's probably more important to know where we have validity evidence, the quality of the validity evidence, and where we're lacking validity evidence as far as use of the SRP College Edition goes. So I'm going to focus on these individual citations I pulled from the literature um, um, throughout the remainder of this presentation. Uh, but also uh, to give you an idea uh, about the basic psychometric properties. This is one of the first studies uh, published in 2008, the previous uh, VAS2 SRP, and it reports um, uh, reliability, validity, convergent and discriminant validity, and um, test retest reliability. And, and also correlations between the college edition and other self-report measures. So I want to let you know that this study um, um, conducted uh, by Nowinski and colleagues um, basically reached the same conclusions that we do in the BASC-3 SRP college edition manual. The basic pro psychometric properties, especially internal consistency, and test retest reliability are quite good. I reviewed them again last night in preparation for this presentation. Um, and essentially, every one of those individual scales you saw on the previous slide has reliability coefficients of about 0.80 and higher. And that was our goal. In fact, this older study is on the BAS-2 college form. Uh, we have improved. Um, virtually all the reliabilities on the BASC-3 college form. So, um, so the results are even better. And what this means is that you can use the college form um, with some confidence in the constructs that you're assessing in terms of um, the reliability of measurement. Also, high reliability is very important for detecting change over time. So if you use the BAS-3 SRP College Edition, it, um, uh, for assessment of change, um, if, since you have uh, good reliability coefficients, if you see a difference in scores from pre-treatment to post-treatment, pre-counseling session, post-counseling session, pre-group session to post-group session, you can have more confidence that that change is real change and not due to chance or error variance. So, um, so reliability is key for assessing change and sensitivity to change. Um, and uh, as I said, we have improved these over the past two. Next slide, please. So here's a construct validity study. Um, and this is a really interesting study I found um, because it was a fairly uh, large sample of 970 adolescents from 16 to 18 years um, um, with histories of disruptive behavior problems and truancy. And 290 students who completed um, the MMPI adolescent form. And, um, because of the large sample size, I thought these results would be uh, very trustworthy. And uh, what they found was that convergent discriminant uh, validity were uh, very good for the SRP college edition. Um, there was less validity um, evidence found for the school maladjustment composite, uh, but the, but the uh, conclusions um, are the same as Nowinski in the previous investigation. Um, but this time we're talking about um, structural validity more so than reliability in the previous study. 
So independent research on a large clinical sample uh, suggests that the reliability and validity data, which I'll show you samples of uh, a little bit later, um, um, so uh, the reliability and the validity data um, as independently studied are fairly strong. Next um, slide, please. So these are some data from the BASC-3 manual uh, on the SRP. And uh, this study is the SRP college uh, as related to the MMPI uh, restructured form. Uh, published in 2008-2011, and it was used with 61 college students age 18 through 25 years. So basically what Pearson did here was collect these data on a subsample of the norming sample uh, at that same time. So uh, essentially what you see here are predict predictable correlations between the MMPI-2 scales that measure similar constructs to the SRP college edition scales. So uh, we see broad emotional problems such as emotional internalizing dysfunction, dysfunctional negative emotions, and negative emotional, emotionality neuroticism. Um, these are uh, correlated about 0 0.50 with the emotional symptoms index of the SRP college edition. And as noted here, similarly, Similarly named scale scores, anxiety, somatization, alcohol abuse, correlating 0.40 or higher. So uh, this is what would be expected. You wouldn't expect correlations of 0.70 or 0.80, I don't think, because the item content is so different on the MPI compared to uh, the SRP College Edition. Um, Similarly, with the Beck Depression Inventory 2, 53 students from the norming sample, 18 through 25 years. The tables are cited here in the BAS 3 manual if you want to look at all the raw data. I just give you a, uh, just a quick summary here from, uh, from our manual, and we see correlations at about 0.6 or above with the Beck total score um, and correlates you know, for many of the BAS uh, SRP college scales, and a correlation with the SRP depression scale of 0.61. Again, that's about right. Uh, it makes sense. The, um, the, the BEC item content, for example, includes more anxiety items and somatization items on the depression scale. On the uh, SRP college edition, we separate those out. So our depression scale is limited to the depression construct and you have separate somatization and separate anxiety scales. So I would not expect um, the BEC to correlate 0.90 with depression scale on the SRP College Edition. Um, this makes sense. So uh, what we're looking at now is some criterion-related validity, similar to the way the previous two studies did, except that these were conducted by Pearson and um, Cecil Reynolds and myself as part of the norming study of, of the BAS-3, but consistent results. Next slide, please. So we've just covered kind of the basic um, psychometric properties. Let's move to the clinical scales and, and what they might mean. Those of you who have heard me give presentations um, on the um, BAS teacher and parent rating scales, Forgive me, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit uh, because these constructs uh, all have IAM content designed to measure these same constructs. The exception that is, is that uh, we have some unique scales on the college edition, and the SRP has unique scales in comparison to the parent and teacher rating scales. And sensation seeking is one of those scales. So um, the uh, black print here are old items uh, from the BAS-2, um, the sort of um, purple periwinkle um, print and an italicized print here are new items introduced in the BAS-3. For those of you who use the BAS-2 SRP college, 
you'll see significantly improved item content on the BAS 3 SRP College Edition. Same constructs, better content, better symptom coverage for diagnostic purposes, and better reliability coefficients. Now, the sensation-seeking scale is, in, is an interesting scale because it is correlated, based upon our studies, with high-risk behaviors. Um, and uh, that's important to note. It's kind of an obvious interpretation. But an interpretation um, that I've heard uh, sometimes uh, colleagues ask about in audiences is that, is, uh, that the use session sensation seeking to predict alcohol abuse. That doesn't seem to work very well. The alcohol abuse scale is a much better correlative alcohol abuse than the sensation seeking scale. So in using the SRP college edition in a clinical setting, I would consider sensation seeking associated with risk taking, maybe impulsivity. And if one is interested in alcohol abuse, um, the alcohol abuse scale is, is a better indicator of that. Now, we do not have a strong uh, multi, uh, you know, multi abuse scale for different sorts of substances. Um, so, uh, on the SRP College Edition, we're really at best screening for alcohol abuse only. Um, and we do not have any investigations, and I could not find any investigations in the published literature um, that I looked through yesterday uh, on the relationship of any of the SRP college scales to other types of substance abuse, um, amphetamines um, uh, or heroin or you know, any other uh, substances. So, uh, so that's an open validity question which SRP college edition scales are associated with other um, drugs of abuse, of the alcohol abuse. So sensation seeking, um, high risk behavior, alcohol abuse, alcohol use, abuse, or dependence. School maladjustment, maladjustment this is a very unique scale. And you notice in one of the previous studies, they could not find a correlate of uh, school maladjustment on the MMPI. That makes sense um, because very few scales include a measure of school maladjustment. So the, um, uh, we really don't have a good criterion measure for school maladjustment on the, uh, for the SRP college edition scale. We will see some evidence for school maladjustment as we get to some later studies by Carrie Schwanz. Uh, that I think you'll find interesting. Atypicality works just as it does on a child and adolescent level, except it probably works better because atypicality is a measure of psychoticism, and psychoticism, that is schizophrenia, um, specifically tends to express itself in late adolescence or early adulthood. So. Um, so the atypicality scale as a measure of psychoticism, a measure of schizophrenia symptoms uh, specifically, is going to work better than it does at the on the adolescent or the child forms. Um, so if one receives uh, or sees a high atypicality score on the SRP college edition, um, it's going to be very important to ask follow-up questions about the individual items. This is why in the uh, SRP college printout, we include the item sco scores and the item responses um, so that the clinician can go back and ask some follow-up questions about what weird things are being seen, uh, why people might think you're strange. Um, these questions are going to be important to follow up on because there are going to be more true positives at this age level. Um, and those of you who, have worked, who work with college students know this well um, because it's so sad to see um, um, 
you know, that first psychotic break um, occur usually between 18 and 25 years of age. Locus of control is an external locus of control. Um, and it can, uh, high scores can communicate a sense of powerlessness. Social stress is a very important scale because we know in um, adolescence and adulthood um, the importance of social relationships and how comfortable um, this individual feels um, in the relationships with others. Uh, this may give you an indication of more introversion in terms of a personality style. Uh, next slide, please. Anxiety. Uh, we've improved the anxiety scale and the reliability of that measure. The anxiety scale actually has better reliability at the college level than it does at the adolescent and child levels. So this is another measure that I think is a better measure of the construct with increasing age. The item content is just more appropriate for the language of late adolescents and college students. The depression scale works at every age level beginning at age eight. So there are very few false positives on the depression scale. If you see a depression scale score of 70 or 79 or 85, there is probably depression present. It's probably beyond the diagnostic threshold of the DSM-5. Um, and that score, had, I, I would caution you uh, to take very seriously. It could be that the depression is due to a medication or more of a, um, a, a Know, a cause other than um, a psychosocial cause, um, but depression is probably still present. Sense of inadequacy correlates highly with depression. Um, so this feeling of a lack of efficacy is often uh, co-elevated with depression scale on the SRP uh, college edition. So if depression is high, sense of inadequacy is almost always high, and the reverse is true. Now, somatization is a separate scale. Why? Because it is quite possible to have clinical elevations, 69, 70, 80, 90 on depression, sense of inadequacy, but anxiety and somatization can be uh, less elevated, uh, maybe in the 60s or maybe in the 50s or, you know, in the average range. So uh, these constructs are different um, and, um, and they may not always be elevated. You may see anxiety elevated in the absence of depression or somatization elevated in the absence of depression as well. Somatization could indicate that this student is simply ill um, and a referral for health services is most appropriate in this particular case. Attention problems and hyperactivity um, work better at this age than they do at younger ages. Uh, so there's more validity studies from other measures to suggest that self-assessment of attention problems and hyperactivity are more valid for adults um, and young adults. So uh, these are important considerations, and I'll show you some validity studies later that flesh out interpretations of these further. Next slide, please. Then we have our adaptive scales. Oops, if you could return the slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, relations with parents turns out to be a very important scale. I'll show you a study about that later. Interpersonal relations, kind of the uh, inverse correlate of social stress. So these scales measure similar constructs. Um, one is your perceptions of relationships, and the other one is feelings of anxiety or stress um, uh, when interacting with others. Very important for young adults, as you can imagine. Self-esteem, equally important, and self-reliance, incredibly important. Move to the next slide, please. So these are the index scores. 
um, and um, the, the composite scales, content scales, etc. So we have internalizing problems uh, composite, um, inattention hyperactivity composite, the emotional symptoms index, and the personal adjustment or the adaptive skills index. In the next slide, we'll discuss anger control, ego strength, mania, and test anxiety. And then another clinical index that's um, new to the BASC-3 and on the SRP College Edition is an overall functional impairment index. Um, and so as you know from uh, the DSM system, uh, one has to document not only the presence of a mental health disorder, but also whether or not it's causing impairment at this point in time. And so uh, this self-assessment of impairment will help the psychologist understand whether or not impairment is occurring. It's not uncommon to have individuals with internalizing problems who are getting straight A's in school. Uh, individuals with, ang with depression, anxiety problems, uh, who are experiencing significant symptoms and um, significant um, you know, concerns about their um, self-concerns about their mental health, but uh, it's not showing up in their grades. It's not showing up in their academic performance. In inattention hyperactivity, on the other hand, is more highly correlated with academic performance. So elevations on inattention hyperactivity would be associated with perhaps some academic impairment in terms of individual course grades or college GPA, whereas internalizing problems is less correlated with that. So uh, functional impairment uh, gives you an indication of whether or not the psychopathology that might be present is interfering with daily activities. Work after school, uh, being part of a work study program, academic performance, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So these are content scales, um, just as we have on uh, other forms of the BASC, anger control, uh, ego strength, um, and ego strength, I want to make you aware, uh, correlates pretty highly with the self-esteem scale. So these two should be jointly high or low. And then because um, individuals in adolescence and young adulthood are um, more likely to display severe forms of psychopathology, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, et cetera, we were able to identify enough items to create a mania scale. And so if one um, obtains, for example, high atypicality scores and high mania scores, then uh, one might uh, want to consider psychosis such as schizophrenia, but at the same time the potential for bipolar disorder as well, particularly if thought processes are rather clear uh, if you uh, assess the uh, items through follow-up questioning on the atypicality scale, um, but this um, very um, rapid uh, thought processes and very high activity levels um, might indicate um, uh, the presence of bipolar disorder versus schizophrenia, and that's why the mania scale is there for differential diagnostic purposes. Test anxiety <clears throat> can be quite debilitating, and for college students, uh, there's certainly um, you know, a lot of uh, high-stakes testing that occurs, and so that's why that scale is included there. Um, moving beyond the scales, the next slide, please. So how might we think about interpreting the college form? These are some of my thoughts. And it, I'm continuously amazed at how truthful students are in response to um, uh, the self-report child, adolescent, or college edition. And what I give you here is a, uh, 
an independent study uh, not conducted by us on the BAS-2 and found the same thing uh, with traumatic um, uh, pediatric uh, mild brain injury patients. Um, so whether it's a kind of a normative population, um, uh, this is a clinical population, a very consistent finding on the college forum is that the lie index, the validity index, the fake bad index, um, the consistency index, um, those are rarely indicating validity problems uh, for the SRP college edition. What we found in one study with adolescents was that it was about half of a percent of the students we assessed, a very small number, had any significant validity problems. So even if you get an elevated consistency scale or an elevated fake bad index, it's probably more an indicator of the presence of psychopathology rather than a response set. Um, so, uh, so in the vast majority of cases, you're getting honest responses or indicators of psychopathology rather than invalidity. Now, we've conducted many st studies over the last more than three decades on the BASC and similar measures as well. And when we, when we created our screening instrument, uh, the BAT Behavioral Emotional Screening System, um, what we found consistently in study after study is that one standard deviation for above the mean is a good indicator of risk if not psychopathology in some cases. So, um, so T-scores greater than or equal to 60 should be taken seriously. They should all be looked at. They may not be important in an individual case. They may not be diagnostic. But we should at least look at all clinical scores above 60 or all adaptive skill scores below 40. Just one standard deviation above the mean is potential problems worthy of addressing or worthy of monitoring. Similarly, uh, in study after study, about two standard deviations above the mean is important. It's much more likely to be associated with a classifiable problem or a diagnosable mental health disorder, whether it's atypicality, which may indicate uh, a case of autism spectrum disorder, um, or psychosis, um, or, or the depression scale may indicate uh, the presence of clinical uh, depression, um, or anxiety indicating a generalized anxiety disorder. About 69 or above is much more likely to exceed accepted diagnostic thresholds as indicated by the DSM, ICD system, or other uh, diagnostic systems. Number four I alluded to earlier, and that is since the constructs are the same for the SRP adolescent and college forms, um, there's a bridge in validity evidence there. And so I think the validity evidence for ages 12 through 17 can be useful for interpreting the college edition. I'll give you some specific examples. And the value added of adding more scales is unknown. Just like younger age levels, um, adding multiple assessment measures of depression, for example, may not be that helpful uh, for clarifying the diagnosis. Um, so I began this presentation talking about screening, um, but you're giving a diagnostic measure uh, in the form of the SRP College Edition. It is relatively thorough uh, in terms of the breadth and the depth of the assessment it provides. And it covers many more symptoms than the BASC-2 version of depression, anxiety disorders, somatoform disorders, inattention, hyperactivity, et cetera, atypicality, uh, psychoticism. So, um, so because of that, this form alone, of course not alone, I shouldn't say that, this form in combination with other information, uh, especially good qualitative information, may be sufficient for drawing a diagnostic decision. Um, so if you give a 
MMPI, a BEC, SRP College Edition, other measures, they may not all be necessary. One or two of those measures may be adequate to the task. And um, the SRP College Edition has language items most appropriate for ages 18 to 25, and that's probably by why it's being used, um, I'm told, on a relatively large scale by universities in Korea in particular um, as a screener, but it does double duty as a diagnostic measure because of its, um, its construction. Next um, slide, please. So I'm going to run through some individual studies here that I thought were interesting and I think you might find helpful as well for interpretive purposes. So if you get a case in front of you of a learning disability, and this is a very high frequency population for those of us who work in higher education, it's probably the largest referral sample for assessment uh, for disability services, for example, and that would be cases of reading disability, written expression disability, for example. And this is a good study to show how the college uh, addition <coughs> um, might produce a, a profile uh, that's useful. So what we see here are, is use of the school maladjustment, sentiment adequacy, self-esteem, self-reliance, depression, and anxiety scales. Um, and basically what they found was that the SRP College Edition produced very few differences uh, across groups. Um, and uh, those with the learning disability versus those without. So, uh, but there were significant gender and age results here. And this is very consistent with um, the gender data we have throughout the BASC-3. And that female students showed um, uh, lower score on the sense and adequacy scale, that is, uh, male show, showed more um, feelings of inadequacy. And as students' age increased, sense of inadequacy and depression also increased while their scores on self-esteem decreased. And this is very common in uh, population studies of the BASC as well. So, so there may not be a specific learning disability profile. This finding is consistent with much of the research on learning disabilities that shows that um, while learning disability may increase risk for self-esteem problems or internalizing problems, it does, um, it does not produce the risk that other disorders does uh, do, which would be um, ADHD, for example, conduct disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder, depression. Um, these uh, social emotional disorders produce far greater risk for other social emotional disorders, whereas learning disability does not. Next uh, study, please. Next slide. <coughs> this is an interesting study that, um, that I thought you might uh, want to be aware of, those of you who are working with college age students or young adults. And it's a good study of uh, female adolescents um, and how you might use the uh, BAS-2 self-report for adolescents to get an assessment of risk for an eating disorder. Um, they were significantly different on 10 of the 16 scales, with five in a clinically significant range. And so I thought you might want to look this study up to um, to get a sense for um, uh, what the results might look like on an SRP college edition um, uh, to see if there's overlap with this particular profile that might cause you to ask questions as a clinician or a college counselor about the potential for an eating disorder. Next slide, please. Um, clinically high risk for psychosis. And um, so, um, so I want you to be aware of this study. 
um, again, uh, this is uh, with the BAS-2, uh, with a special emphasis on the use of the atypicality scale in the self-report for adolescents. And, um, and uh, the results um, basically found that the atypicality scale works. And, um, and use of the combination of parent and youth self-report uh, improved the prediction of psychosis risk. So it's one of the few studies we have to show some evidence for the utility of the atypicality scale for the assessment of risk for psychosis. Um, so I want you to be aware of that. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Adolescents with prior concussions. It's a really interesting study, I thought, um, in that essentially uh, what was found was that pre-morbid psychosocial functioning was a really good predictor of post-concussive psychosocial functioning. Um, so this study shows the importance of history taking. So as you know, adolescents, young adulthood are you know, high-risk age groups, and so in the college environment, you're going to see individuals and, uh, who were in automobile accidents or bicycle accidents, for example, where they took a head injury, or sports programs where they're um, receiving um, one or multiple concussive head injuries. And so if you see, for example, um, depression, uh, post-concussive injury, um, it could be due to the concussive injury or it could be due to pre-morbid depression or depression risk that was maybe exacerbated by concussive injury. Um, so this is a great study documenting the need for good history taking. Next study, please. And here's one um, I wanted you to be aware of, child tornado survivors. This is a self-report inventory for younger children. But I wanted to make you aware that there are a variety of studies in the literature showing that trauma um, can be assessed, exposure to trauma can be assessed by the SRP. And this gives you an example of kind of the variability of the studies out there on various types of trauma, uh, whether it's children exposed to school shootings. This is the only study I could find of tornado survivors. Um, but the emotional symptoms index social stress, locus of control, relationship with parents in the study were all associated with exposure to tornadoes. Next study, please. This is Carrie Schwanz at Coastal Carolina University. I give you her contact information here. She's probably done more um, validity work on the SRP College Edition um, than anyone I'm aware of. And this is uh, relations with parents and academic performance as uh, assessed by the SRP uh, college form. Uh, two studies with fairly large uh, samples, um, 466. And she looked at the relations with parents subscale um, as a student um, assessment of parent relations. And academic performance was um, assessed by using university GPA. And uh, what she found was essentially good parental relations were associated with GPAs. And uh, a significant negative correlation between parent relations and probation suspension status in college. So this might trigger another good question in a clinical assessment uh, for a student in a college counseling center. You know, how are things going uh, with mom and dad? Um, and uh, next study, please. Next slide. Here's another one by uh, Carrie Schwanz and colleagues, and where she looked at uh, parent relationships again and the self-reliance scale uh, to see if they predict anxiety and depression for 153 college students in intro to psychology courses and compared it with uh, other anxiety and depression inventories. And what she found that both self-reliance, that is the ability to 
you know, feel like one can get things done in college and be responsible for one's work. And parent relations were both predictors of anxiety and depression. So this might suggest that building self-reliance skills among college students, um, as you know, many university counseling centers do, um, can be uh, potentially helpful for mitigating the onset of significant anxiety or depression problems, and maybe building parental relationships. Um, these are important findings in both these studies. I think about how even at 18 to 25, relations with parents are important. Next slide, please. These are additional studies that Schwanz and colleagues have conducted. And so I wanted to make you um, aware of all of them. If you pick up um, the SRP, or if you uh, want to email uh, Dr. Schwanz and try to get uh, copies of her two APA presentations, uh, these might be helpful to you. Next slide, please. So those were, are some potential interpretive implications. Um, individuals with learning disabilities may show no evidence of psychopathology, and that's an important consideration. Um, free morbid social emotional functioning uh, uh, may be predictive of post-concussive social emotional functioning, et cetera. This is just a sample of SRP printout results. Um, as you would, as those of you who use the SRP see uh, from uh, Q Global. Um, next slide, please. You also see intervention recommendations. Um, and primary, secondary improvement areas and adaptive skill strengths. Um, and primary improvement areas are basically those areas that are two SDs above the mean, secondary between one and two SDs above the mean, 60 to 69. Next slide, please. And um, implications or indications, excuse me, for um, uh, intervention and different types of evidence-based interventions for uh, mitigating, in this case, hyperactivity, if it's uh, found to be elevated. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, mapping to DSM-5 symptomatology. Next slide, please. And um, this is a slide about uh, the 2014 stance taken by the director of the NIH to no longer use the DSM because of validity problems. Uh, so we do have to categorize with uh, caution um, uh, whether we're using the VAST results or not. Um, next uh, slide, please. These are gender uh, differences by age um, on the SRP Child Adolescent and College Edition. And um, so positive values indicate higher female scores. Negative values indicate higher um, male scores. And I want you to be aware of this because of the very lawful increase in, in internalizing symptomatology for women. And um, as you see there, the highest peaks uh, indicated by those light blue bars there, um, they just get higher with age. So for anxiety, at the 8 to 11 age level, it's virtually normal for uh, women and girls. Uh, at the next level, um, excuse me a moment, someone just came in my door. Yes. Three? No. Uh, I don't know where three is. Okay, okay. That's okay. Excuse me, sorry. Um, the, um, at the adolescent level, we see um, um, women's anxiety at uh, four points above the mean, or more than a third of a standard deviation, and at 18 to 25, six points above the mean on average, or um, you know, two-thirds of the standard deviation almost. Uh, that's pretty remarkable, that developmental trend. And then you see the next highest peak is for somatization um, as well. So this worry, somatic complaints, it, 
ever increasing for um, girls and, and women. And um, so, uh, we saw it on the original BAST. We saw it on the BAST 2. We saw it on the BAST 2 when it was normed in Spain. Um, and so uh, it's been seen even cross-culturally as a very consistent trend toward worry and somatic complaints. Next slide, please. And then if we, if we look at the adaptive scales, um, uh, we don't see it. Uh, what we see is that uh, for the college edition, um, in particular, um, boys have, um, uh, men have um, in, uh, decreasing self-esteem with increasing age, um, which I think is an interesting uh, finding as well. So girls, women, more um, anxiety, somatization, uh, boys, men, less self-esteem with increasing age. So I want you to know that these gender differences are normative. Do we have data on um, individuals in gender transition? No. Uh, I've not seen a single study, so we don't know what to say about that. So um, th these are uh, just individuals that have declared a gender uh, as part of the normative samples and uh, other sorts of these studies. Next slide, please. Um, here, um, we have some cross-cultural research. And I wanted to show you the basic psychometric properties for the BAS-2 when it was um, adapted for Korean culture. Um, I, my conflict of interest is a potential here because I'm the third author on this study um, uh, with um, Chad Abesutani and uh, Christine Ahn. Uh, but basically, um, they found that um, 30 different Korean universities um, uh, were using the SRP College Edition. They found very similar psychometric findings to the BAS-2 uh, College Edition in the U.S. So I want to let you know that this is an adaptation. I don't know what percentage of the items were adapted. Certainly a minority of the items had the language changed. It seems like it was just a handful, as I recall, um, but very similar results. So gender is very important from a developmental standpoint of gender identity. Um, and uh, culture, um, cultural data that we have such as these suggest that the SRP College Edition functions similarly across cultural groups. Next slide, please. And this is just about concussive head injuries and, um, you know, with college sports and um, in this particular age group um, uh, where we see automobile accidents and other sorts of trauma, it's just really important um, to ask questions about concussive head injuries even if that's not the presenting problem. Uh, to make sure it's not exacerbating social-emotional functioning. Next slide, please. This is the BAS-3 Behavior Intervention Guide. Um, and those of you who use the BASC are aware of this, but I just wanted to make sure those of you working with college students are aware that evidence-based interventions for college students are included as well. Kimber Van Est is the primary author um, on this particular um, uh, part of the BAS-3. Next slide. And this is self-management for attention problems, which can be quite important for a college student. And so this um, gives you um, an example of how that might be applied with a student. Next slide, please. More self-management, specific steps based upon uh, the evidence in the literature. Uh, next slide, please. Interventions for hyperactivity and the different ones that are available here, such as self-management. Next slide, please. Very good. I apologize for the sirens and someone wandering in my front door. <laughs> I didn't plan on that, um, but I'd be happy to take a, 
take a, a few questions at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Camphouse. Um, there's actually not any current questions waiting. We only had one about the reading level during the during okay. uh, your your talk, and I, I mentioned to that person that the reading level on the SRPs, uh, the reading levels range from 1.9 to 2.1 for the forms, the SRP forms, uh -huh. a little higher for parent and teacher. Um, mm -hmm. But there are no there are are no waiting questions. Okay, very good. We thank you all for your attendance today. Really appreciate your time. Um, hope that you enjoy using the BASC and um, come watch future webinars. We'll close out for today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.